Up today, we're going to be speaking with John Sheldon, Chief Marketing Officer at Smile Direct Club. John, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you've had a long storied history in the marketing space over 25 years, starting off on the agency side, uh, brands like Ogilvy and BBH and moving on to places like eBay, MasterCard, and of course, where you are today at Smile Direct Club as CMO. Um, tell us about, first and foremost, I'm always interested in this, your your challenges of going from the agency side of things to the brand side. Yeah, I mean, the good news is I had an opportunity that was a little bit of a way station in between in my the work that I did at eBay. I actually worked in an area of eBay called uh, eBay Enterprise Marketing, and we did um, we ran the performance marketing for about 120 uh, e-commerce retailers. Uh, this is before retailers all realized they needed to own this themselves, and so they had been outsourcing yeah. it. And uh, one of my clients actually was eBay itself. So it was my parent company. And so uh, I, always, I always felt a part of that marketing team. I was kind of an inside outside person as part of that process. And so it kind of served as a bit of a, a way station for me on on my way to being an in-house uh, you know, client side person. Was that the original GSI Commerce business that eBay acquired? It was. I, I was with GSI Commerce for about 11 days before... Uh, before oh, wow. eBay bought them, they, they didn't buy it obviously because of me. But um, right. but it was a uh, it was a, a really fun transition to be a part of that and and that yeah GSI Commerce was doing really interesting things for for e retailers who who at that time wanted to outsource that work. Yeah, I'm from Philadelphia, and that was one of the original Philadelphia tech companies, and a lot of my friends actually of a high school. Um, a uh, classmate of mine, Michael Rubin, started GSI yeah, exactly. Commerce, and uh, yeah, no, Michael's done quite well for himself. Oh, that's for sure. Um, and a lot of a lot of folks um, I've known throughout the years have worked there, and then obviously became eBay and huge success story. Uh, so really interesting. So now you're you know CMO at Smile Direct Club, and obviously we're in a very interesting time, and we'll talk about the macro. But yep. why did you join Smile Direct Club? And did you know anything about sort of the dental industry when you joined? Like, what was the kind of drivers of that decision. Yeah, it was funny trying to explain to my friends why I was joining a dental company uh, because I've right. had no background in that whatsoever. Um, you know, for me, what drew me to Smile Direct Club was really three things. Number one, um, you know, getting to participate in the consumerization of healthcare, which is been an ama amazing macro trend um, that's been going on. Two, it really brought together a lot of the different skill sets um, you know, that I've been building up, right? I kind of started on the quantitative side of CRM and then, you know, ultimately started just adding and broadening my skill sets with, with branding and, and, and digital transformation, et cetera. Uh, and, then, and then third is really the purposefulness of the company. Uh, I, I'm really attracted to the impact that we can have on, on people's lives, right? I think I would have a yeah. hard time selling something I didn't feel awesome about. And, and the fact that, you know, Smile, at Smile Direct Club, we're, we're part of a customer's, you know, broad-based transformation in their lives. We're just one part of that. And so being able to be alongside of them as they're losing weight, taking control of their life, handling their divorce, going to college, whatever that thing is, um, you know, we can also, we can be a really visible um, part of what that transformation they're going through looks like. And, and that purposefulness, I kind of, I, pro I projected that onto the business when I said yes to join it, but I've seen it come through in spades and I feel really great about, about that part. So when you talk about the consumerization of healthcare, obviously the healthcare space still is so dated, has taken so long for it to digitize and, and disrupt itself, uh, you know, when compared to, uh, against almost every other industry. What do, what do you mean by the consumerization of healthcare and what role does Smell Direct play in that overall? Yes, the direct to, the direct to consumer world is infiltrating healthcare, um, you know, all over the place, right? Whether you yep. think about businesses like Q Health with their at home testing, uh, you know, work or um, you know Teledoc. some of the D2, right, obviously all all of the telemedicine efforts that have gone on in the last you know 10, 12 years, but but then you start taking them pieces like like Smile Direct Club where. You're taking a 112 year old industry of, of orthodontics and completely, you know, upending that for, because you're basically, you know, putting the consumer, uh, you know, enabling them to kind of start the process and initiate that. Obviously, there's still a doctor involved end to end, and you need that doctor in every part of the right. of the process. But now, you know, the, the, it's not just like I ran that lab because the doctor said so. It's Hey, I've, I've I've got this concern about my you know I might have COVID. I'm going to run this test. I'm going to you know in that all of that has been kind of pushed out back to where where the consumer has much more control of the 
of the process. And and that's also true with uh, with Smile Direct Club, where we're, we're at, you know asking the consumer to to identify when they want to get their teeth straightened, and then and then to work in collaboration with that doctor to to make sure that happens. Yep, and obviously, right now, obviously, growth is such a huge driver of technology businesses. Now, more recently, profitability has taken center stage as well with all the macroeconomic changes that we've seen unfold. All that being said, where are you spending your time across the overall funnel in terms of the overall brand hierarchy of Smile Direct Club in terms of how you communicate your unique selling proposition down to performance marketing and making sure you talked about quant earlier, how numbers work. What's the pie chart of your time in terms of where you're spending it and, and where your efforts are focused? Yeah, it's it's um, it's really. Uh, I would say my time is broken into four key categories. The okay. first is build is building the brand, right? Mm-hmm. We're still a young business. We've only been advertising for a little over five years. The great news is we've got terrific uh, aided awareness. I'm um, in the business. When I started, it was about 16 percent. It's now 61 percent aided awareness in the United States. So that's great. Um, however, what we've turned, you know, once you cross that 50 percent mark, you really turn your guns to to the to the unaided awareness. Um, right. I, might have, I might have misspoke before. I think, yeah, aided awareness is 16 to 61. We're turning our guns to unaided awareness. So people unprovoked will know that our business does uh, what we what we say we do. And and so spending a lot of time thinking about how to build that business. I'm a I'm a big believer in you know, Byron Sharp's how brands are built, uh, you know, being mentally and physically available for, for customers um, you know, on a broad basis. And so just making sure our name continues to be out there, that people continue to feel positively about our business, that because we're in the healthcare space, that we're building credibility for our business in all the ways that we need to. Um, and so that's about 25% of my time. The second uh, is, is, is the day-to-day performance marketing stuff, right? You know, just looking at the conversion funnels and all of the, all of the efforts that we're putting into uh, to, to our media there to just make sure that our CAC stays exactly where it needs to be um, and and that we're you were able to have a, a profitable a profitable business. And how has that third, changed? Sorry to interrupt, John, but but ha- no. to, uh, to double click on number two. How has that changed with all the recent um, you know evolutions in Apple's privacy policies and your ability to retarget with cookies? I mean, it, has it made it incredibly harder? It's it's harder. I mean, no doubt it's it's harder. I think we were probably one of the first public companies to actually talk about the impact that iOS fourteen yep. five had on our business. Um, I was over a year ago when we started talking about that uh, in, in our in our um, quarterly reports, and um, you know, no no question that it impacted our business and it's shifted our uh, media mix strategy pretty dramatically because uh, you know we are no longer able to see some of the key signals that we used to be able to see. Um, uh, so that's definitely that's definitely been a pain point. And, and by the way, the same things that they're doing on the CRM side of the business are are having some impact, um, you know, as well from a privacy perspective. Um, and, you know, we, we just know less about what emails were opened and and, and so on. Um, right. You know, on on the flip side, what we were doing is we're, we're trying to find other new first party ways of kind of identifying critical audiences and 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 building out from there and. And we're actually, um, obviously, our, our, our paid social you know, took a big hit in terms of its efficiency about a year ago, and, and we've built it back. And we're now operating at the same levels of efficiency as we were oh, wow. a year ago. However, however, albeit at a much lower volume, the ability to incrementally you know, spend the next dollar and have it be, be you know, at the right levels of profitability, I would do it if we could. But, but we're, we're at much lower spend levels than we were than we were you know, at that time. And so, and you mentioned the shift. You said, how do you shift your, your spending? Where is it shifted towards? Yeah, I mean, we're really, you know, trying to do more, I'll call it mid-funnel consideration work. Um, and, you know, and, and so things like OTT, things like YouTube, where we're, we are targeting audiences explicitly, you know, retargeting audiences explicitly. Um, however, you know, you know, with the ultimate goal to kind of drive them, you know, back in through things like, uh, you know, organic and paid search. Got it. Got it. So you talked about brand building, you talked about performance marketing. What was the third area? Yeah, the, the third the third key area is in really defining the customer experience. And so my team owns a digital experience app, uh, uh, site, CRM. And so just making sure that we're continuing to optimize that customer experience to, uh, you know, ensure we're pulling people through all of all of the right ways. And so, um, you know, right, you know, we're looking at how we go to market. We're looking at, you know, a diff- you know different elements of um, 
of the, that process in its own right and how we can leverage net new technology to make that to make that better. And that, that kind of leads to bucket four, which is really innovation. Right. And right. so, you know, you know, broadening our audiences, uh, broadening, uh, you know, creating a much better go to market strategy than the one we have today, which is which is actually quite long. Right. We, we acquire a person. They have to buy a kit and scan. They have to return that kit and scan. They have to then, um, uh, you know, make sure that that's accepted. Then they then they get a treatment plan and then they buy. And that process is is lengthy. And we joke all the time about nobody wants a cold hot dog. And so, you know, we have we have some drop off in that process. And so I'm spending a lot of my time thinking, what are all the ways that we can shorten that window to get a person to understand what they're going to get in working with us and our doctors and uh, and making sure that they uh, that 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 go to market isn't isn't two to three weeks. It's, you know. I would ideally, I would like to say two to three minutes, but we're not quite there right. yet, right? So how do I how do I shorten that window of of um, uh, of the go to market? And that's just one of the areas of innovation I'm I'm spending time in. And then and then obviously, um, there's a, you know when we launched our business, uh, we thought about uh, the market that had never been able to access orthodontics before, right? People who couldn't afford six to eight grand for braces or Invisalign. Um, you know, we're out here at, at two thousand dollars, making that accessible to people who'd never had it before. Yeah. Well, in the process of building this business, what we've come to realize is that eighty to ninety percent of the overall market would benefit from using our model. The convenience, the cost, the outcomes are all better than uh, than what we've that we're seeing from other folks. And so we're we're now trying to go to the traditional um, orthodontics customer, right? High household income, parents of teens, and saying, "Hey, guys, there's actually a better way. We've proven it." And we're and we're out and so all the ways that we can make sure we're hitting on that um, that audience uh, are it's it's a priority for us. And you know a year ago we launched a challenger campaign um, specifically to um, uh, to hit on that. And and there's more coming in terms of product offering and beyond that that's going to really make sure that that traditional orthodontic customer actually comes to benefit from all the things that we've built for uh, the folks that we gave access to this in the first place. Yeah. I mean, it's such a huge addressable market and you're right. So much of the market is still to be opened or addressed. And if you can bring it to the right price point, make it convenient for consumers, there's just so much growth there. So it makes That's sense. Right. Just to back up a little bit, when you talked about the first two areas, brand building, and then you talked about performance and you're shifting to more mid funnel. I know you, your company has done a lot with TikTok. Um, and I was reading a little bit about the Emily Watson story, which I thought was yeah, fascinating. I can tell you every, obviously every single big brand I'm talking to these days and even smaller companies are fascinated with TikTok. Um, our very first episode had Sophia Hernandez, the head of uh, business marketing of TikTok on it. Um, just talking about how important auth that authenticity is and how that's something brands still in this day and age struggle with because they're, they're trying to be too controlled, too contrived. You've had some early success on TikTok. Would love to hear about your efforts there, more specifically um, about Emily. Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, TikTok. We've been we were early on TikTok over over yeah. three years ago. We were making investments there, and uh, it's been a really strong category for us. And actually, now it's it's now uh, basically at the top of our of our leaderboard, if you will, on you know where we're spending spending some money on uh, certainly on the digital space. It's because our audience is there. Right. Our right. primary audience is 18 to 35 year old women, um, you know, and, and that's where they're spending they their time. Right. And so what we've really done in TikTok is is a strategy that really has three components to it. The first is um, we're adapting our you know, broad based marketing to the things that we know work in that environment. So what we're doing, we have, we have our character, um, Didi, that, that, that you know, does our TV work that can compares us to our challenge, you know, the, the company we're challenging and, and, and she's doing bespoke work specifically, you know, on TikTok based on, um, you know, some of the things that we're seeing trends that we're, we're seeing there, et cetera. The second piece is probably the biggest piece of what we're doing is we're leaning into creators, right. And working really broadly with creators on, on, you know, because they know what works in that space. They're, they're, they've, they've, they're, they're the ones who've mastered how to create eyeball worthy, you know, That's content. where authenticity lives, right? They're doing it for the love of of what they're creating versus trying to be a paid chill for a brand. And for what? And and, and this you're dead on. And what we, what we care about most is they have to actually be a customer. If they're talking yeah. about aligners, they have to go through treatment. If they're talking about our whitening product, they have to use it for a week for real. And we're being very explicit about that. And and because we don't want, we're not trying to 
borrow equity to borrow equity. We're trying to build credibility. And that credibility comes from the authenticity. Right. right. And then the third piece, which you've alluded, alluded to, is the great story about, about one of our team members, uh, Emily Watson, who, who really is the primary face on our TikTok channel. Um, you know, the great story about her was four and a half years ago, she was a model in a photo shoot. That's when she got introduced to the brand. She then became a customer. We straightened her teeth. Um, she then loved the experience so much. She wanted to work for the company. She came in and, and has worked her way to a place now where she's actually running the face of the company in that TikTok environment. And, I, and she's so amazing. great at spotting the trends and, and working with the, we have a broader content team that she she's very, you know, works extensively with to help say, how can, Hey, here's this thing that's going on. How can we make our brand relevant to that? And just help, you know, tie our brands um, into that. And it, it's TikTok is an environment I always talk about content creation having two styles. There's the studio work that's long lasting, um, high risk, uh, and, and, and you have to really think about it for a long time. And then there's the newsroom, right? This is the stuff that's fast moving. It's low risk as long as you, you know, obviously with certain safeguards, guardrails. Um, and, and you need to be able to be relevant to what's happening right now. Most brands struggle to connect themselves to what's happening right now because the the, the, the guardrails are too tight. And so, yeah. you know, the work that we've done with that team and, and, you know, Emily and Nikki Harmon, who's on that team as well, leads that team, um, you know, the work that they've done to, to help us be responsive to what we're seeing, you know, in TikTok, on Twitter, what have you, um, you know, has, has really helped our brand become, you know, more and more relevant. And I think, you know, that, that story is so inspiring to me because I think it should give young people a lot of hope because it's so much about what you do versus what you say. You know, people can have a resume and they can go to a great college and they can interview with you and say, I'm going to do this, this, and that. That's one, you know, candidate. And candidate two is somebody who's done all these things, who's actually built a brand, who's built a following, who's shown passion. Who are you going to hire in this new world? And I think, you know, that whole notion of having people, you know, really prove their worth, I think could be so impactful. Listen, my career has been a, a scar-ridden career of, you know, helping startups that, that, that didn't make it and, and you know, having your know, businesses break away and then get re-sucked in. And, and, you know, I had my own company I started in 2001, not the best time to start a company, but actually it's still around, um, you know, and, uh, up in the Boston area. And so just having um, uh, scars, uh, you know, experience you can bring to the table is so incredibly valuable. And, and just trying stuff, even if it's, you know, you know, low risk, if you're in, you know, something you do with your, your fraternity or your sorority, but you, 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 you've out there and you've, you've had your fingers in whatever, a uh, Facebook ads manager, because you were trying to right. drive people into your sorority yeah. website, that, that means something. You, you it means, did it means so much more, you know, I mean, one thing I've always had success with, again, is asking people, what have you done? What have you built? What have you created? versus telling me what you're going to do uh, because mm -hmm. you have every opportunity at, at early ages to prove that you can put hands on keyboard and do things. And that's mm -hmm. definitely one piece of advice I'd give to young people starting out um, is to go out and do things. And to your point, even if it fails, you're at least showing initiative and initiative is so key. Um, you know, you talk about things like, um, you know, expanding the business and innovation. Innovation comes from ultimately somewhere, someone in your organization taking initiative doing something that they're not told to do. And next thing you know, you're identifying a whole new business opportunity. Yeah, that's right. And and my time at MasterCard was loaded with that, right? I, I um, uh, headed up uh, innovation management for the company worldwide. And and it just, just being able to see hundreds and sometimes even a thousand or, you know, ideas, you know, from all over the company that you can like think about rank, rate, say, oh, we've seen that before. Hey, that's something new. Um, you know, that's a good idea that we're not going to get to. That's a great idea that I want to invest behind. And, and managing that innovation pipeline, um, you know, was a role I played. And, and, and just the ability to filter through ideas quickly and understand, you know, where, where the ones that are the great ones that are worth investing in um, is, is, is critical. And, and, that, and that's a challenge I think a lot of, of mid-growing companies face is uh, there are so many good ideas laying around. They try to do them all. And the, yeah. and the hardest part is to basically st stop doing the good ideas so you can execute the great ideas. And you exactly. know, I would say even in Smile Record, we're still working through that, but I actually think, I think we kind of got there. Um, and that's been a really cool part to see this business mature 
over the last, you know, my tenure here, which, which has been the last four years. Super helpful. And, and, you know, the last thing I'll ask you about is customer experience. You talked a lot about that in terms of really trying to optimize the way that your customers experience the service that you're offering. You know, how do you get feedback from those consumers in terms of what's working and what isn't? And what have you found have been some of the big unlocks in optimizing customer experience? There's no better two hours that I spend every week than one hour watching videos of our customers in our smile shops, obviously with their permission, right. um, where we watch them go through that journey with the smile guide, the questions they ask, the 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 places where uh, there Literally was a lack every of, week. Every, oh, week, every, week, week. Right. every week yeah. I'm watching these things for an hour. I've seen thousands of our customers, well, probably, probably about a thousand customers go through that journey. We take clips and show, hey, here's where this thing happened. They were really uncertain here. Is there something we can do to communicate earlier how this works, all of those elements and, and finding the ways to say it just the right way and uh, uh, when we should be communicating in, the, in their overall journey, how we can use CRM better, all of that. Um, you know, that hour is great. And then the second hour is, is we're doing calls, sales calls, c- customer care calls, again, all with permission, just listening to, you know, what's the customer struggling with? What are they facing? And so on. I'll give you one example. We got to a place where we heard one call where the customer asked our team member to help explain all the things that came in their in their box. You know, you get one big blurple box with all your aligners in it. And all of a sudden we're like, what if we just did an orientation call with every customer? Right. And so we experimented with that and actually went quite well, although it's hard to get a hold of people. But then we realized right. that we're just saying the same thing over and over again. Why don't we just make a, a customized video for that customer's experience? And now every customer gets that customized video along with their box so they can understand what's in the box. That's why smart. is it tailored to them? How does it work for them? And by the way, what we find is those people call less frequently, complete treatment successfully more, all of those things downstream. So so it's it's the, the, the little nuggets that you pick up with being yeah. a customer obsessed person, um, you know, help you create better experiences, better outcomes, more referrals. Across the whole funnel, right? It's a game of inches. Yeah, it's, it, it yeah. is. Uh, we talk about this all the time. Is is you know, we have, and that's the big challenge. Is in one hand, in customer experience, you're playing a game of inches game. You have to make sure you you create the space for the innovation, right? Because you can tweak and tweak and tweak and polish, and those and we've done an inordinate amount of that. But we also had to step back and say, okay, we've polished that thing amazingly. How can, how can we break it and make it way better? And so it, it's that combination of those two things that help you know, really become, become uh, excellent at customer experience. Yeah, I mean, we live in a world where everybody wants that instant gratification and the, those huge big ideas. But I think the best businesses are ones where little ideas like the orientation idea you just talked about, which turns out to be actually a huge idea, right? But if you look at across the entire um, you know, funnel of when somebody first hears about you, to when they're finished using your product, if you can incrementalize every touch point throughout that and do a little bit every single day, the next thing you know, all your conversion numbers are better, your MPS is higher, your business is growing faster. Exactly right. And that's really the game is is connecting that. So um, this is super helpful. And you know, I think my observation of you is that you're somebody who really understands the benefit of both um, art and science in marketing. I think, you know, right now the can, um, you know, a festival, a festival of creativity is going on, right, which celebrates big creative ideas. But one thing I've, um, you know, found over the years is a lot of these big ideas aren't really connected to real business metrics. So I think there's such importance of amazing creative without real metrics connected to them. It's, it almost doesn't matter. So I think understanding the mix of art and science is incredibly impactful. It seems like that you've done a good job of balancing the two. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I always think about this the work that gets done at Can. The great stuff is you know the top of the line great stuff. But there's a lot of pieces that get celebrated in that environment that are breakthrough creative concepts that aren't connected to the actual brands in in meaningful ways, right? Yeah. Where I, I say this to um, you know my 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 wife sitting next to me all the time. She's like, "Oh, that was so that was so funny." And then three minutes later, I'd be like, "That spot that you said was funny. What brand was that?" Uh, right? And she's like, time. "I don't know." All she's the like, time. "I don't know." And I'm like, "There yeah. you go." So. You know, it was breakthrough. It connected with you, but they didn't connect it to the brand. And like right. that happens so often. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that often happens when you give agencies the keys and you don't really keep them connected to those business results. So they're, you know, their interests necessarily aren't aligned with the bottom line of the business. And I think in this world, that's obviously going to change because companies are going to be more and more focused on driving the bottom line. 
Um, you know, in that regard, in this world with rampant inflation, more pressure on the consumer, how is Smile Direct sort of reacting to that uh, in the marketplace? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're uh, again, we're, I think we feel, our finger is on the pulse sufficiently that we were reading these tea, two, two mixed metaphors, but we were reading these tea leaves about the focus on, on cash flow, uh, free cash flow generation, uh, you know, early on. And so we started making moves on this. Um, in Q4 of last year. And so we are refocusing our business on, on ensuring that we can get the business as quickly as possible, safely as possible with growth to that to an area with uh, where we're, we're just floating on free cash flow as opposed to anything else. You know, the last several years with interest rates as low as they've been, money has been like getting more capital has been cheap and easy. And now yep. I, th- I think sure the capital has. markets are drying up. I think you're seeing the, it, the Getting money costs money, and so um, you know this this in, this focus is now shifted toward ensuring that you don't need to go do that. And so having a business that that is now free cash flow focused, as opposed to EBITDA focused, or as opposed to top line growth focused, um, is really where where it's at, uh, particularly for you know the, the class of businesses that Smile Direct Club is all in. You know these these I'll call it uh, six to twelve year old companies that are all yeah. they all had tremendous growth. They all. Uh, you know, generated great brand awareness. They've they, they've they've built um, honestly phenomenal businesses, but now they've got to turn those phenomenal businesses into something that generates the free cash flow they need. Yeah, and back to back to the fundamentals, right? And, that's and, really we're, we're, and we're all over that as a business. That's great. That's great to hear. Well, this is super, you know, informative for me, and I'm sure it will for our audience. And you know, we covered so much in a short period of time, and that's really what we want to do with the podcast, the speed of culture is cover a lot of sort of deep rooted insights in a short period. So that was super helpful, but just a personal question for you in this fast paced world, you obviously, I can tell your brain moves a million miles a minute. What are some of the things that's, that slow John Sheldon down in this world? Oh, goodness. Uh, you know, I, I think being in, intentional with my kids, um, yeah. slow me, slow me down. Have? So I have two daughters, uh, uh, one just graduated high school and the other one is uh, going into her senior year at, at, at my alma mater at Penn. Um, oh, and so uh, so they're, they're older. And, and it's funny, I always joke that uh, golf and parenting are the two ch- most challenging things you can do for the opposite reasons. In golf, you have to forget everything that happened before and everything that happens after this shot. Right. With parenting, it's the opposite. You have to take everything that happened before into account and all the potential implications, you know, downstream from what you have to do in this in this moment. And and so I spent I'm I'm much more focused on being very intentional in 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 dealing with my kids. And so that that slows my mind down a little bit while I explore, like, okay, take a breath. You know, how do we get here? What could happen if you do this wrong? Um and so, you know, or, or or right. Uh, you know, obviously want to be positive there, but um, that, you know, that's one thing. But, uh, and the other thing is I'm, you know, I'm a completely rabid sports fan uh, for both the Patriots and then I'm a Man United fan for Premier League. And I watch almost all of their games on both, both teams. And it's so weird how you can let some group of random men, uh, you know, completely make or break your mood. Uh, you know, people come in, they're like, how was your weekend? I'm like, both the Patriots and Man U lost. I had a terrible weekend. Right. right. And you're like, wait, why did I let that happen to me? I don't know. But it's part of my personality. I just like the ride. Me too. I'm an Eagles fan. Uh, so sorry about that 28 team win, but we deserve yeah, one. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the other whatever it is now. Exactly. Seven. Take the other six ranks. Um, well, thank you so much for joining. This has been amazing. Um, and a lot of insights I think that our audience can take away. So on behalf of Susie, and the Ad Week team, thanks to John for joining us. Um, happy Father's Day, by the way, John. Uh, Thank you. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. And thanks again. So on behalf of myself, we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. 